Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Rose, and I'm a doctorate student at Université Laval at the Department of Forestry. Uh, my director is Ilga Port, and my co-directors are Nathalie Isabel and Jean Bousquet. Today, I'll be giving a talk about my project called Understanding the Adaptive Capacity of Forest Species for Climate Change from the Standpoint of Populus Tremoloides, a Keystone North American Tree. In this study, I will be looking at Populus Tremoloides, also known as Aspen. Aspen is one of the most widely distributed North American tree species, ranging over Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Aspen can thrive in a, a diverse range of conditions and even in extreme environments, such as mountainous regions or dry system environments. Even though this wide range shows the species high adaptability, an increase in mortality rates has been observed in recent years, mostly in the western US and in the prairie provinces in Canada. Um, this main cause uh, of decline has been linked to an increase in drought periods due to climate change. Moreover, there is a natural occurrence of clonal reproduction as well as reproduction through seed, and there is an occurrence of tree ploidy next to a more commonly observed diploid individuals. Both tree ploidy and clonal reproduction are thought to be favored by dry system environments. In fact, the largest clones and most tree ploids have been observed in the West US in previous studies. Polyploidy may have advantageous effects on, under certain conditions. However, these populations often reproduce asexually and therefore have lower genetic diversity and are more vulnerable to pathogen attacks and abiotic stresses. Uh, these populations are therefore especially at risk during climate change. Due to climate change, climate zones are predicted to shift northwards with hundreds of kilometers by the end of the century, as can be seen here for Aspen. On the picture on the left, we see the current climate suitability zone uh, While well, on the right, we see the optimal climate zone has shifted northwards by hundreds of kilometers by the end of the century. Species can deal with these changes by either using phenotypic plasticity, adapting, migrating, or they face the probability of extinction. However, climate zones are uh, shifting northward faster than the ability of many tree species to mi migrate, and uh, phenotypic plasticity alone is not enough. Um, therefore, these species uh, are pressured to adapt. Uh, therefore, it is essential to understand the ability of these forest tree species to persist under the projected climate change, in other words, to understand their adaptive capacity. Um, due to the wide distribution of aspen, it's an excellent species to study adaptive capacity. So the goal of my study is to identify the genetic mechanisms involved in the adaptive capacity of Populus tremoloides. Two key aspects of determining a species' adaptive capacity are assessing their genetic makeup and phenotypic plasticity. So therefore, my first objective is to assess the genetic makeup of Populus tremoloides across the entire range using a genomics approach. And second, it's to test for phenotypic plasticity through common garden experiments. We use genotype by sequencing data with 1,375 individuals. And after SNP calling and filtering, I obtained around 40,000 SNPs and 1,072 filtered individuals. I tested for population structure and I identified four major clusters one in the Northeast North America, one in Northwest North America, a Western US cluster, and a fully novel Mexican cluster that has not been studied before. Um, the Western US cluster is congruent with what, what was found by previous studies. Um, previous studies also identified one Northern cluster instead of two, uh, but they had lower sample sizes, which could explain why. Moreover, I identified substructure for most clusters, and I will go through one of uh, these as an example. Hereafter, I will talk about ploidy identification and clonality assessment for all individuals. One example of substructure that we identified using spatial PCA is this clear gradient from north to south in the cluster that is encircled in the, with black in the corner on the right. Uh, the figure basically indicates that samples that have a similar color are genetically more similar, uh, meaning that the uh, samples in the north that are more bluish are all genetically more similar while the samples in the south that are more reddish are also more similar. The pattern that we see here is found in many other tree species and can be explained by the presence of multiple glacial refugia in the east of the United States during the last glaciation. Uh, it is proposed that the expansion after the last glaciation happened from a more western refugia and a more eastern refugia. I, I indicated these potential refugia with the white stars and their post-glacial expansion with the arrows. Uh, we aim to study this more in future. I then determined ploidy with my custom script based on allelic depth for my GBS data. The results give a ratio per individual and are then plotted, as you can see here on the right. We see two groups, one of diploids, the left cluster, and one uh, cluster on the right, 
which are triploids. Uh, moreover, uh, for around 100 samples, we knew the ploidy before we started the project because um, they were tested with flow cytometry. The known samples in diploids are depicted in cyan, and the known triploids are shown in purple. We can see that all samples closer to the correct group except this one purple individual. In total, we identified 959 diploids and 113 triploid individuals. I then identified clones among our samples in the program GenoDive using the infinite allele model as we are working with SNPs. It is important to note that uh, clones here are defined as unique genotypes. We identified a total of 694 clones, thus unique genotypes, among our 1,072 uh, samples. I will now give a summary of the number of clones and ploidy states per cluster. Um, so in the table in the first column, you can see the name of the cluster and the color of the row corresponds to the actual cluster on the picture on the top right. Uh, we can then see the number of total individuals, the percentage of unique genotypes, the percentage of unique genotypes that are triploid, and the percentage of unique genotypes that are diploid. We can see that the two northern clusters have the highest number of unique genotypes, while the Western US cluster and the Mexican cluster have the lowest numbers. We have to state that there was a difference in sampling strategy, so the number is slightly biased. However, we still see a trend of having um, more clonal reproduction in regions that are drug prone. Moreover, the highest number of triploids was observed in the Western US, followed by the Mexican cluster and the Northwest North America cluster. Almost no triploids were identified in the eastern part of North America. We thus think that both ploidy and clonality are more present in clusters that are more prone to drought stress. Um, based on the pairwise FST, we can see that the divergence between the two northern clusters is very low, uh, while the two other clusters have higher FST values and there's more divergence. These clusters correspond to what is known about the glacial refugia and post-glacial expansion in the species. Um, however, due to limited time, I will not go into detail about this. Most noteworthy on the population statistics is the lower observed heterozygosity in the Mexican cluster um, and the Western US cluster, uh, which can potentially be explained by the higher presence of clonal reproduction, uh, as this means that there's most probably longer generation times. Um, moreover, the observed heterozygosity was lower than the expected heterozygosity in all cases. Moreover, part of my project aims to get insights in the phenotypic plasticity of Aspen populations across the entire range. I did this with a germination experiment with Quebec and Utah genotypes using three different temperatures, 20, 28 and 36 degrees, and one level of drought stress against the water control. To keep it brief, I will just share my main result, which was that I identified a significant lower germination rate for Utah genotypes under drought stress in comparison to Quebec uh, populations. We think this could be a seed survival strategy for Utah genotypes under drought. In future, we also plan to perform a common garden greenhouse experiment with uh, populations from each cluster. To conclude, we identified four major clusters and found novel substructure in uh, the Mexican and Northeast North America cluster. Moreover, we found that there is a higher occurrence of triploids and clonal reproduction in clusters that are prone to environmental stresses. Uh, overall, Understanding the biogeography and genetic mechanisms that are currently in place in Aspen will help us predict the future genomic vulnerability of the species under climate change. Thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Hello everyone, I am Anu Prakash, PhD student at University of Vermont. Welcome to my talk on evolution of species ranges in the face of changing climate, a NSF funded project at Kerala Lab. So how does a species respond to climate change? Climate change is nothing new and the species has been able to keep pace with changes in climate in the past. The illustration at the bottom shows the gradual change in distribution of spruce species over time from 21,000 years ago to present day. However, rapid rate of climate change in recent decades hinders the species from keeping pace with changing climate. This results in migration lag. This is a huge hurdle for species with long generation times like trees. As such, trees would need to rely on existing genetic variation and phenotypic plasticity to respond to climate change in place. 
such plasticity may provide a more immediate short-term response. The focal species for this study is red spruce or Picea rubens, found along the Northeast America. It is a temperate coniferous species adapted to cool, moist climate through the, throughout the Appalachians with a continuous distribution towards its northern range and fragmented distribution towards its southern range. The fragmented distribution at south is due to the history of range expansion after the glaciers melted, resulting in population either moving northwards in latitude or upwards in altitude, resulting in sky islands. For this study, 340 individuals were selected along its range. The individuals in the northern continuous distribution is known as the core, the southern uh, fragmented distribution is known as the range edge or the edge, and the region lying in, the, in between these three regions is known as the margin and is also known to hybridize with black spruce. On whole exome sequencing of these individuals, it was found that all these regions are also genetically distinct and form into three distinct geogenetic regions. The offspring of these individuals are then grown in three common gardens along its range at Vermont, Maryland, and North Carolina. A climate PCR was done on selected environmental variables and the PC1 was able to explain 49% of the variation with higher PC1 values indicating colder climate and higher seasonality and lower PC1 score indicating warmer climate and lower seasonality. The functional traits studied are bud break, bud set, and height growth. These functional traits encompass a growing season. Bud break or bud flush signals the beginning of the growing season and is primarily responsive to accumulation of warm temperature in spring and thus is measured in cumulative growing degree rates. The amount of height growth during a single season is used as fitness proxy in this study. Finally, the fall growth cessation and bud set are initiated by decline in photo period and temperature. This can begin as early as June and extend till November. All the traits studied had heritability of 20% or more, with bud break being the most heritable trait. In order to understand the sensitivity of a functional trait to varying environment and partition the variance explained by the genotype, environment, and the interaction G by E, I plotted reaction norms. The plot on the left shows the genotypic variation present at family level in the trait across each garden site. The x axis represents garden site from northern garden site of Vermont towards the southern garden site in North Carolina. The y axis is budget timing in terms of the day of the year. The plot shows that there is a significant G and G by E for this trait in 2019. The plot on the right shows the geogenic difference for the bud set timing. The colder core region tended to set bud earliest compared to warmer edge region that set bud the latest across each garden site. For the second growing season, some trends emerge at the family level with buds setting much later at Vermont compared to Maryland and North Carolina. However, when looking at regions, both the core and edge have similar bud set timing, setting buds earlier compared to the margin region. In order to understand the magnitude of changes in bud set timing, I tried to look at it in terms of climate transfer distance. It was calculated as the difference in mean annual temperature at the garden site and provenance source. So the x-axis indicates increasing transfer distance from the source climate or as increasing temperature compared to source and the bud set timing is plotted on the y-axis as you can see, with increasing temperature, the buds tended to set earlier for all three regions. Looking at the bud break data, here the y-axis is in terms of cumulative growing degree days required before the buds flushed. Vermont Garden required the least amount of heating units to flush buds compared to Maryland and North Carolina. Looking across the region, it shows that warmer edge region required the most amount of heating units to flush buds compared to the colder core region. Looking at the transfer distance plot, the heating units required to flush bud increased with warming temperature, with edge region requiring the most warming out of all three regions studied. Next, I wanted to see how plastic the traits were. For this, I selected four trait values within family. Out of the three gardens, the trait values at the garden closest to the source climate was designated as home, and the garden furthest from source climate was designated as away and the corresponding trait value as trait away. 
Then plus T was estimated as a, as shown in the equation here with straight home and a straight away by straight home. When plus T values were plotted against quickness, if the values are positive, it meant that the trait value were highest at the home, and when it was negative, it meant that trait values were highest at the away side. This gave the direction of plus T. In order to understand whether it was adaptive or not adaptive, there the absolute value of plasticity was plotted against fitness. If the slope was positive, then it was adaptive, and if the slope was negative, then it was maladaptive. Looking at the results, plasticity of parts in 2019 on the x-axis and height growth as fitness on y-axis. The general trend shows that bird set tended to be later at home, both at family and population level. The inset plot shows the relationship between absolute plasticity and fitness for all three regions. At family level, core tended to be significantly adaptive, while edge was maladaptive. This trend holds true at population level as well. Bird set in the following year of growth exhibited similar trends with bird setting later at home at family and population level. However, the inset plot shows that the absolute plasticity for all three regions are maladaptive at both family and population level. Looking at the bud break data set on the other hand, buds tended to uh, break later at away side at both family and population level. However, only margin region was found to be maladaptive for this trait. To summarize, the climate transfer distances shows that a warmer environment leads to plastic shift towards earlier bud chronology at the end of the growing season and delayed start to the growing season due to higher requirement of warmer days. The plasticity in phenological trait was also found to be maladaptive. Even though the region shows similar levels of G and G by E for its functional traits, the mean difference between the regions suggests that the degree of maladaptation varied with region and was found to be much higher in margin and edge region compared to the core region. These phenological changes would lead to a shorter growing season and result in reduced fitness. Over time, plasticity present in the population might not be enough to respond to climate change in place at lower latitude, and the future generation would need to migrate upwards in latitude or in altitude. This will further lead to contraction of its range even more, and the fragmented sky islands towards the southern part of the distribution would be no exception thus eventually leading to that spruce distribution limited to northern region of its range. Additionally, due to selection pressures, the genetic variation present in the species will also be reduced, making it more vulnerable to climate change. I would like to view these regions not as spatially distant geographic locations, rather as temporal slices where an edge region represents how the unmitigated climate warming will affect the species in the future and the core as the potential for the species to thrive in a more greener future. Thank you.